So the title of my talk is Using High Resolution Molecular Markers to Identify Populations of a Continuous Drafter, <laughs> the American Kestrel. But before I start talking about how we can use genetics to identify and monitor populations of American Kestrels, I want to review just a few of the many challenges that we've talked about today that we face when we study American Kestrels. And then I'm going to use a proof of concept to explain how this method works. Um, these methods were developed by Kristen Rueg and her partners at UCLA, and they're being implemented to study a lot of different migratory species, mostly songbirds, but also um, raptors and uh, maybe some owls too in the future. So anyway, uh, oh, and thank you to everybody. This is a really big collaborative project, so I wanted to put my acknowledgments right at the beginning because I really couldn't have done it without all the help from, you know, Sarah putting me in contact with all of you and the, everybody with the Kestrel Partnership, Hawkwatch International, and yeah, thank you so much. So for centuries, ornithologists and bird enthusiasts, much like everybody in this room, have wanted to know where migratory species spend the non-breeding season. And we've talked a lot today about why we might want to understand where migratory populations go when they're done breeding. So I want to, there's a lot of reason we would want to know this information. And for the American kestrel, one big reason is that kestrels are experiencing decline. But these patterns and um, trends are kind of mysterious. We have evidence that different regional groups of individuals are experiencing decline in different ways, and it's possible that these populations are experiencing um, region-specific threats or stressors, or that they're experiencing stress at different phases of their annual cycle. And for these reasons, it's really important that we understand where these individuals are going during all these different times of the year. But another reason we might want to, oh, Oops, I thought I upgraded this, uh, so I took this slide out. But anyway, if you see here, um, just a review of the trends, they vary regionally, so it's likely populations are experiencing different threats. But also, raptors and the American kestrel are monitored during migration. And this is a really big resource because raptors, you know, they travel along these major flyways where they concentrate and they can be counted. But I want to review this concept because when we use migration data to estimate population trends, we make a couple of assumptions. And one of them is that we are sampling a consistent proportion of a population that migrates past one of these sites and overwinters um, at a lower latitude and in the same general region um, every year. So when we uh, observe a decline in the number of individuals being counted at a particular site, we contribute that to population decline. But if, um, like Sean had mentioned earlier, kestrels and other species start to respond to warmer winter temperatures by not moving as far, the proportion that we're sampling at each one of these sites might change over time. And as a review, uh, kestrels we have a lot of evidence that suggests they are shifting their migratory strategies, and this is causing shifts in wintering distribution. So here we can see kestrels on average are moving shorter distances, and um, their wintering distribution is shifting poleward, but it's different for different regional groups. So how do we interpret migration count data if we don't know which populations are being monitored, and we know that kestrels um, are changing their migratory strategy. If we look here, for example, if we had the ability to understand um, where individuals at this population, this watch site, and this watch site are coming from, we could, uh, like, it's possible that this is due to shifts in migration movement. Um, and over here, you know, if all these individuals assigned to the same population, maybe those individuals um, are experiencing severe decline. So at any given watch site, we want to be able to know which individuals we're monitoring. And traditionally, we've done this in a lot of different ways. Um, geolocators obviously give us really good information, but they can be rather expensive. 
Um, and there are lots of challenges we face with geolocators. And bird banding is a traditional approach for studying movements of populations. But for kestrels, band recoveries are less than 2%. So we know kestrels are changing their migratory strategies. Um, and band recoveries are less than 2%. So if we want to study the link between certain migratory um, breeding and wintering populations over time, we really need to uh, invest in different methods of studying um, migratory connectivity. And the big question that I'm interested in is how can we develop methods for getting information from every bird that we capture or handle? And a new approach that Kristen Rueg is really promoting is this uh, high resolution genetic tags. So we can use tissue from the base of a feather to, and statistical analysis to assign an individual back to a population of origin. But how does, oh, sorry. <laughs> the advantages of using this approach is that if we capture an individual at any phase of the annual cycle, so at your nest boxes, at migration watch sites, or on the wintering grounds, we can use the DNA from just a few body feathers, so it's minimally invasive, and we can map that individual back to its breeding origin. Um, and this is also really exciting because it allows me to collaborate with all of you wonderful people. But how does it work? Well, um, I'm going to explain how this process works and how we develop these tools by walking through um, the Wilson's Warbler example. So much like the American kestrel, very little was known about population-specific migratory movements of the Wilson's Warbler. And there was supposed to be a map there, so I'm going to try something. That wasn't supposed to happen, but we knew very little of population-specific movement patterns, and also um, traditional genetic analysis suggested that the Wilson's warbler is pretty much one thing and maybe two, so two breeding uh, populations. So we didn't have high-resolution separation of these breeding populations. But the first step to developing the tools for population assignment is to get a very detailed map of how genetic variation is distributed across the landscape. And we can do this using new genetic technology that allows us to scan the genome. And the genome is just all the DNA that codes for you know, an individual. So if you sample individuals at all of the extreme edges of their breeding range, and you look for single base pair changes that vary between different individuals from distinct geographic areas, you can correlate those geographic areas with that um, specific genotype. And if you do that over a large area and over hundreds of these sites, you can get you can build a map for statistical assignment and have really reliable um, tools. So the Wilson's Warbler, traditionally, it was um, you know, just two genetic populations. But with this new technique, Kristen Rueg was able to identify <coughs> six genetically distinct populations. And for the Wilson's Warbler, that's really important to understand because see here, you have individuals on the eastern and the western part of the Sierras um, that are genetically distinct. And when we get farther into this, um, I will talk more about that. So once you have this really dense map of the breeding range, you can pick out those single base pair changes that are really informative for specific locations. And you can create these rapid genetic assays so that you can pluck a feather from an individual during migration or on the wintering ground, use the DNA at the tip of that feather and use statistics to assign that individual back to its population of origin. Now, some of the uh, advantages of using this technique is that these assays, once they're developed, are relatively inexpensive and they're fast. Um, and we've been doing this with other taxa for a really long time. 
We do this with uh, migratory salmon all the time to assist managers in moving salmon up the river past certain dams. Um, anyway, if you want to talk more about that after, let me know. <laughs> um, so once you have these assays, you can sample individuals at all parts of the annual cycle and you can map those individuals back to where they came from and that's a really powerful tool. So if you look here at any of these uh, arrows, these are specific migratory stopover sites that are really important for the Wilson's warbler. And we know that in certain areas, um, development is a big issue. And we were able to sample these migratory stopover sites. And we can see here that, you know, we get nice proportions of which, which populations are being monitored at these sites. And the same goes for the wintering area. So let's say here in Baja, if all those Wilson's warblers assigned back to coastal California, which is this tiny little area, um, and there's massive development going on in there, that's a, probably a really big problem. And we should focus our management efforts on addressing that problem. So where are we with the American Kestrel? Well, in 2016, we started um, developing these methods for studying migratory ecology of the American Kestrel. And we did this by collecting blood sample. Oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> People have used genetics for a long time to try to uh, describe <laughs> the genetic variation in American Kestrels. But when you use traditional molecular methods, you don't get very high resolution separation. And um, previous genetic studies have suggested kestrels form, you know, two genetically distinct populations. All of North America looks pretty much the same when you use, you know, just a few microsatellite markers. But in 2016, we collected blood samples from um, nine different breeding locations, and we used this new. I'm sorry, this was supposed to be fixed too. Um, we used new genetic technology to sequence the genome um, in a, well, it's a reduced representation of the genome, but we can scan the genome and find these SNPs. Um, anyway, <laughs> we've, we've scanned the genome and we've discovered thousands of SNPs, and this is just a preliminary principal component analysis, but if you look at this, um, this PC plot, you can see that individuals from Alaska, Texas, and Florida really separate from individuals in the west and in the eastern part of their distribution. Um, and we have more information now. We've resequenced some of these individuals. So we have more sequence data and more individuals. And we need to do more analysis to see if we can get even more separation of these groups. So what's the next step? Well, we really need help from all of you because the reliability and the strength of this tool really depends on how well we sample the breeding range. And for kestrels, you know, we have breeding individuals all over North America. So we really need to collect feathers from all of these, these areas where we're missing um, information. Because the next step is to screen all of these feathers and to beef up our statistical baseline so that in the future when we sample individuals during migration or on the wintering grounds, we can say with like fairly good confidence that they assign back to their true population of origin. Um, so the big question was, can we get information from all individuals that we handle? Um, the answer is that Yes, but it takes a little bit of time and a lot of effort and collaboration. But once we have these tools, we can screen feathers and map individuals back to a population of origin. And there are so many things we can do once we have this tool working and it is reliable. Um, you know, I pulled up this map in the beginning to say that it's really difficult to interpret migration count data when you don't have the ability to understand which populations are being monitored. And with this tool, we'll be able to understand which populations are being monitored, how proportions of certain populations are changing over time, and how individual phenology is changing over time as well. Um, so with that, 
I will take any questions.